All right. Uh, it's a major that's designed to help students put together for themselves a deep understanding of the dynamics of power, of how markets work, but then also to think about what to do, what is the right thing to do when one has to make choices, when there are trade-offs. And so we're so delighted today to have Wayne Xiong. I see that he has a national following, some of whom are here today. Uh, the students from Yale um, are probably meeting Wayne and hearing about him for the first time. Um, so, you know, at the, at the risk of repeating what many of you know about him, let me just say a few things about him. Um, he is the co-founder of Direct Action Everywhere, and he's going to tell us about that organization, what he's doing. And this, his activism, which has exposed cruelty and rescued animals in factory farms, has resulted in a terrorism investigation by the FBI, so that he's currently facing 16 felony ch charges in four criminal cases and will go on trial this year depending on how the courts uh, <laughs> decide to proceed. And then, of course, that also means it depends on the pressure that the public puts on the courts so that they would or would not want to uh, embarrass the judicial system if the, the public is very supportive of what he's doing. Um, he's been featured in Wired magazine, in the New York Times, in The Intercept. Some of you have seen those pieces, but let me tell you a little bit about his intellectual background for the Yale students here. He did a philosophy undergraduate degree at University of Chicago. He has a JD from the University of Chicago. He studied economics at MIT in the PhD program. And so he brings to bear on questions of real importance, of real ethical importance, the, this deep uh, intellectual training and commitment as well. So I don't want to take any more of your airtime. This is a poster for you to take home with you. And thank you, thank you so much for coming. We're really delighted. Thanks, Francis. I really appreciate uh, the invitation. I actually came to Yale once before many, many years ago, and it's always an honor and, and really exciting to meet all the students and hang out in New Haven because it's a cool town. Um, I was going to tell you a little bit about what we do, but I thought instead of telling, I'd just show. So I'm going to start out by just showing a quick little video. This is the future. And these are people risking everything to save it. Life is being exterminated, but the resistance is growing. Our government has been corrupted. Our civilization is built on a lie. But the truth is out there, and it's spreading. Our eyes are opening. Our hearts are burning and getting ready for direct action. DXE activists are occupying slaughterhouses worldwide. We are shutting down massive factories of abuse. We are taking back our democracy. We are saving hundreds of animals. And this is their story. The industry is hell-bent on stopping us. They've arrested hundreds of peaceful activists. But they can't stop a mass movement. Every voice they try to silence is joined by 10 others. We 
because we're bringing the fight everywhere. From the courtroom to the front lines. Because our future depends on what we do today. Because direct action is everywhere. We're giving everything for a world without slaughterhouses. We're giving everything for our planet to come back to life. We're giving everything for the right to rescue. We're giving everything for the animals of this earth to be safe and happy and free. This is the fight of our lives and we need your help. The future is in our hands. Our voices are rising. The tide is turning. The entire globe is moving. And the time for change is now. Join us. Uh, I guess this is the first time most of you have heard from an alleged domestic terrorist and you know I come to you as an alleged domestic terrorist with many apologies because I certainly have no desire to be a domestic terrorist or an alleged domestic terrorist. I have no desire to cause the, West, the FBI and state and local law enforcement to waste the millions of dollars they've wasted on you put, trying to put me in prison and uh, I, I wanted to show you this video first to give you a sense of what we do, what we do. And for the rest of the talk, I want to say something about why. But before I do that, did everyone see Joaquin Phoenix's Oscar acceptance speech yesterday? You want to see that? Okay. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Because Joaquin put it, in many ways, more eloquently than I can. I'm going to show you some science, talk to you about some sociology and political science. But Joaquin made a very simple point, that at the root of so many of the evils we face on this planet today is our disconnect from the natural world, our disconnect from each other, from our communities, from both the plants and the non-human animals who share this earth with us. And that disconnection has led to systematic slaughter, destruction, and violence on a scale never before seen in history. And that is why I've done what I've done over the past couple of years. And that is why I'm facing the federal charges, the state charges, the federal investigations, the state investigations I'm facing today. So the plan for the talk is pretty simple. I'm not going to talk too long. This is a fairly small group. So if you have a clarifying question, feel free to jump in, raise your hand. I'm happy to answer any questions. We'll have some time afterwards because I'm hoping to talk for just about 20 minutes or so about why, if we are serious about, frankly, not just climate justice, but social justice, we absolutely have to include animal rights. And the three reasons are set out right here. And I came up with some kind of useful mnemonic devices to think about these things. But there, there are three values that animal rights provides, even a human rights activist, that we really have to understand if we want to get serious about climate justice and social justice in this country. And, and the first is diagnostic value, that we need to, to consider animal rights because what happens to the animals will happen to us. They are the canaries in the climate mine. The second is the animal rights movement actually provides immense instrumental value to human populations and human civilizations. When we eat our dead, they come back to haunt us. And third and finally, the animal rights movement has intrinsic value. Animals are their own. They have feelings of pain and pleasure. They have families just like us. And they are subjects of, of, of justice, just like any marginalized community. And so if we want to really have a just community, if we believe our society is a just society, we have to impose what I call a political stress test on our institutions and test how are the most marginalized being treated. Because after all, the test of justice is not, is not how the powerful and the wealthy are treated. In every society in history, even dictatorships and kleptocracies, the powerful and the wealthy are treated with decency. The test of a good political institution, of a good political uh, system, is one where the marginalized are treated with respect. So let's jump in to the first. Um, but let me actually say some more about the nature of the problem we face. And I'm going to show you some videos that explain the intersection between climate justice and animal rights. Because while we all understand, and, and in the city of Berkeley, where I'm from, we've now declared a climate crisis, most folks don't know about the non-human victims of this crisis. And I'm going to show you some photos and videos that demonstrate these non-human victims. I'm going to warn you ahead of time, some of the photos and videos I'm going to show you during this talk will be a little bit distressing. So as a trigger warning, if you need to step out, if seeing animals in some degree of distress. I'm not going to show you anything too gruesome or awful, but I will show you some sad scenes of what's happening to animals across our entire planet because of climate change. Okay, so here's the first video. So this is a recent video that National Degree of Graphics shared, an increasingly common video of a polar bear mother and her cub. 
And polar bears, for those of you who don't know, have lived in the Arctic for millions of years, but over the last 30 to 40 years, all the food is disappearing because the ice is disappearing. They can no longer find a place to hunt and find food. For, so for the first time in history, I'm actually going to pause it real quick. Polar bear mothers have been forced to go after prey that are not natural prey. So a walrus is a 1,300 to up to 3,000 pound animal. A polar bear mother is about 500 pound animals. And what it, ecologists have found when they're out there in the Arctic is they see these polar bears actually trying to attack animals that are far larger than them, that they should not be trying to consume. So what happens is when, when these polar bears are not finding Arctic sea ice, where they historically have found Arctic sea ice, they just keep swimming and swimming. They have to go further and further north, further and further north, because where they usually give birth to their babies is in these southern dens, these warmer places, and then they go north to hunt, and their babies will fall behind them. But as they're swimming up, they're seeing scenes like this unfold across the Arctic. And I'll just show you this scene too. So one recent study found that as Arctic sea ice disappears, when they have put collars on polar bear mothers who are going into areas where Arctic sea ice has started to disappear, um, sometimes these polar bears are being forced to swim 400 miles over nine days because they keep swimming expecting to find ice. The ice never appears. And one study found that half of polar bear cubs in these low ice regions are drowning to death. And when the mothers arrive at the northern places, their babies have all died. They are starving to death because they've been swimming for nine days, nonstop. And they arrive at land that has no more food left. So this is another scene from National Geographic. And all these poor polar bears have left to feed on in some cases is just garbage. Um, so polar bears are just one of one million to say that again, one million species that will be gone from the face of the planet Earth over the next gener generation if we don't do something about climate change and habitat destruction. And while polar bears are the charismatic megafauna, and obviously we care about polar bears, it's important to note that there's so many other ways climate change is decimating uh, non-human animals. Does anyone know what the most numerous vertebrate animal on the face of the Earth is? This picture should give you a little bit of a hint. The most numerous vertebrate animal. Insects are the most numerous animals. And I think ants are, by biomass, one of the dominant species on this planet. Any guesses? Close. It's a little bit bigger than a krill. Krill are sometimes so small that they're almost microscopic. This is similar to krill. It's, it, this, this species of animal actually feeds on krill. Any guesses as to what this is? Okay. So it's actually probably the dominant animal in our ocean ecosystem. And by biomass, for those of you who don't know, aquatic ecosystems comprise about 99% of the biome of Earth, 70% um, of of the surface area of the planet Earth is ocean. And because the ocean goes deep, it's, on the land there's only one level, right? There's only one plane for land. Well, the ocean actually has, it's almost like there's, there's 10 Earths layered on top of each other because you have the liminal state, you have the midwater, you have the deep water, all these different states. And this is a deep water, a midwater, deep water sea fish called the bristlemouth fish. And ecologists have found, surprisingly to many, that the, the, the bristlemouth fish dominates pretty much all species of animals possibly combined. They're anywhere from uh, 1 trillion to 1 quadrillion, or I'm sorry, 100 trillion to 100 quadrillion bristlemouth fish all over the oceans. And the reason we started realizing this was because when we started doing deep sea dredging for fishing, which are these huge kind of like shovel-like devices where they just take everything in an entire ocean ecosystem and try and get the five or six species of fish that we want to eat, and you probably heard about all the other animals that get swept up, what they find over and over again is these bristlemouth fish, which are these little cute you know, finger-length fish that have bristles as mouths. You can imagine them being like a, a swimming toothbrush. If you've ever had one of those hotel toothbrushes, they're about that big, right? They've got little bristles at the end. They're very cute animals. And they have translucent skin because in the deep, there, there's really no need for their skin to block sun radiation because there's no sun. They're in the deep. Well, what, what scientists and ecologists have found is over the past 10 to 20 years, partly because of the thermohaline process that I just described, the ocean waters are no longer sinking because they're warm and warm water rises, cold water sinks. There's no more oxygen in the deep. And what that means is the hundreds of trillions or hundreds of quadrillion bristlemouth fish can no longer breathe. They're literally suffocating. And what they do instead when the oxygen, the dissolved oxygen in the ocean, because the ocean water is no longer sinking, sinking is not coming to them, is they go to the top. They keep swimming to the top. And they're all crowding at the liminal states, the, the top layers of the ocean. So you've probably all seen one of these kind of campy horror movies where someone's trapped in a room and the water rises, right? And it's like, it's kind of a scary scene. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm trapped in this room and I'm clawing and the water keeps rising. This is what's literally happening to quadrillions of animals. 
So that's like, you know, quadrillions, 100,000, a million times more individuals than the entire human race combined. More human beings, more, more animals than have, than, than have existed, than human beings have existed on the face of the planet Earth and all of the Earth's history are all rushing to the top layers of the ocean because they can no longer breathe and they're suffocating to death. Okay. Um, this is just one scene of, of the sorts of things we're going to start seeing much more often of literally billions, quadrillions of fish being shoved to the top layers of the ocean and dying. This specific image is actually because of an algal bloom, which is a very similar phenomenon where all the oxygen in the ocean disappears. The fish rush to the top to try and get close to these top layers so they can get some oxygen, but most of them just die off. Okay. And then finally, the New York Times actually just wrote about this. Um, everyone's favorite animal, the platypus. When I was a little kid, I loved the platypus. Um, so over the past few years, we've seen that because of all the, the heat and the wind and the dehydration that's being caused by climate change, the ponds, these are aquatic animals, like again, most of the animals on this earth are aquatic animals. Because the heat is causing all the ponds and streams to dry up, there's just muddy slop left. These poor platypuses that have lived in these aquatic ecosystems, sometimes for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, no longer have any water left. They're slopping around in mud, which means they starve to death because all, all the food they normally would eat would come from an aquatic ecosystem which doesn't exist. And so you've got these platypuses traveling many miles, and they don't walk very well, trying to find water somewhere. And instead, they usually will slowly starve to death, be hit by a car, or be predated on by a cat, a fox, or some other animal. Um, scientists have found that over the past couple decades, 41% of the range historically that had platypuses no longer has platypuses. They're all gone because it's all drying up due to climate change. So cumulatively, one million species, as I said, are going extinct due to habitat loss and climate change. This number continues to go up. We are facing the sixth math extinction crisis on the planet Earth. But many folks will even see these cute images and say, well, why does this really matter? I mean, let's get serious. Platypuses are cute. Polar bears are cute. But at the end of the day, you know, they're still not human beings. They're not us, right? So why should we get serious about this? And why should we do things like what I've done, which is to challenge factory farms and environmentally destructive corporations to the point that I'm risking 16 felony charges and the rest of my life in prison? In fact, one very prominent economist, maybe the most prominent climate economist, actually, any guesses as to who the most prominent climate economist in the world is? No, he's not an economist. He's a linguist. Nordhaus. Who's Bill Nordhaus? Who said that? <laughs> Who's Bill Nordhaus? You want to say? Nordhaus. William Nordhaus, but who is he? He's the guy who invented the electric car that described the quality of the temperature between. Oh, wait, no, it's just, I don't know, I didn't know exactly. Like, yeah, he, the salt of the climate. Yeah, so he, invited, he, he invented a, a system called DICE. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a program to understand. I think it's dynamic, integrated climate. And I forget what the E stands for, so I don't even remember. But he won the Nobel Prize in 2018 because he's, he's one of the most serious economists on the issue of climate change. And the Nobel Committee awarded him this Nobel Prize because he was taking a lot of time and effort to try and understand how human beings can adapt to all the destruction and devastation caused by climate change. And he's done good work in understanding how climate change is going to affect everything from Bangladeshis whose homes are being flooded now to you know, Americans living in New Haven who might have more extreme weather and tried to like, understand economically what are the impacts going to be, sociologically what are the impacts going to be on human civilization. And again, his work is so renowned, it won him a Nobel Prize and you should go take a class with him. But Bill Nordhaus has a little bit of a problem in his model and I've pointed this out since 2006 when I first published a paper on this subject in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review and that is, um, and actually let me just ask you, I, I've just talked to you about some of the impacts of climate change on non-human animals, on natural systems. So when you look at Bill Nordhaus's models, anyone want to give a guess as to if, if Bill Nordhaus uses his DICE model and estimates how much money we should spend in protecting non-human animals? What is the cost of climate change to all these non-human animals, the one million species that are going extinct? What is the number, the figure that Bill Nordhaus says we should be spending to protect all these animals? Just throw it out there. Zero. Yeah. So in, an, in a book that he wrote in 2000, he said that the impacts on non-human animals and natural systems are too small or uncertain to be measured. So therefore, our models are just going to exclude them entirely. And the same has been true of the IPCC, the World Health Organization, the United Nations. Over and over again, we find that the, by far the most numerous victims of climate change are being completely ignored. So as I said, I think this is a farce. And I think that even if you look at things from a humanocentric perspective, in other words, from the perspective of human civilization, we need to get serious about animal rights. 
But we also need to think about intrinsically what obligations we have to the natural world, to the other inhabitants of this earth. Um, and the first reason is because of the diagnostic value of animal rights. This is an image from Indonesia. Uh, has anyone heard about what's happening to orangutans in Indonesia? Yeah, so it's annihilation. So there's been uh, a decline of about 100,000 in their populations. There's estimates range from a few thousand to maybe tens of thousands left. They only exist in two different islands, I mean very large islands, Sumatra and Borneo in Indonesia. A beautiful species of incredibly compassionate animals. They're, they're wonderful. They, they, they don't harm anyone. They do harm each other. But you can go and watch them and they won't attack a human being. So they're gentle giants and they're being exterminated. And one of the reasons is palm oil plantations, which you've probably heard about. But another big reason is, is what? Any guesses? I'll give you a hint. What's happened in Australia recently? Fires, right? And those fires are caused by climate change. There's been massive change in extreme weather events, desification of the entire ecosystem. There's so much dry, um, dry areas, like where this baby orangutan is standing, where there used to be all sorts of vibrant foliage and, and, and flora and fauna that would prevent a wildfire from erupting. And wildfires are one of the big culprits that have driven orangutans nearly to extinction. In fact, a 2007 report indicated that much of this uh, much of these wildfires were almost directly related to increasing temperatures and, and droughts that prevented normal ecosystem practices that would prevent wildfires from spending too broadly from causing Borneo and Sumatra to burn to a crisp. Well, what happened to orangutans in 2007, if we had been paying attention to it 10 years ago, would have predicted what's happening in California today. And this is an image from California in 2018. For those of you who don't follow what's happening in California, there have been massive wildfires in both Northern and Southern California with exactly the same characteristics. High winds, very dry weather, drought for long periods of time that lead almost any spark from a power line to cause a raging blaze. And in fact, in 2018 alone, 2 million acres of land burned to a crisp, exactly like this. There were 100 plus fatalities and hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. Hundreds of thousands of people had to leave. So 10 years ago, it was happening to the orangutans. Last year it was happening, in fact, this year too, because I was mentioning to many of you, the 2019 wildfires only burned, only burned, burned 300,000 acres instead of 2 million acres, but that came at a steep cost too, because the only reason we didn't have wildfires was because PG&E just shut the power off. We didn't have power for about a week. Okay. So another example of the canaries in the climate mine. Um, anyone heard of the chytrid fungus? Any biologists in the room? So the chytrid fungus is a fungus that has been spreading to amphibians around the world. In one genus of, of frog called the harlequin frogs, there have been something like 67 out of 110 species that have gone extinct over the past few decades. And this fungus is a fungus that grows in warm, moist conditions. There's some evidence that when there's a lot of climate stress being imposed on the animals, higher temperatures, uh, these animals are more prone to the infection. And what happens with the chytrid fungus is it gets into the frog's teeth and their skin and just slowly eats them away. So you may have heard about man-eating bacteria. This is a frog-eating fungus, and it's causing amphibians across the world to go extinct. Um, so in 2006, there was a paper, paper in Nature basically saying that climate change was one of the main culprits. And while there's some debate about how much climate change has caused the growth of the chytrid fungus, there's no question that climatic conditions have at least caused more stress to the animals, which leads them more prone to being infected by the fungus. Well, guess what happened just last year at Stanford? Um, a study was done by Aaron Mordecai at Stanford University at the medical school showing that climate change is causing higher disease rates in human beings too. And the literal quote is, it's coming for you. And Aaron was not talking about people in sub-Saharan Africa. We've probably heard about dengue fever, you know, uh, malaria, the, the, the coronavirus in China. She was talking about people in North America. Because as climatic conditions change, as we have higher temperatures across the previously more temperate regions of the earth, mosquitoes go all over the world. Uh, disease and pathogens that previously were not able to reproduce as rapidly and as effectively as they are today are increasing. And the WHO now estimates that within the next few decades, we could see a 300,000 person, 3, 000, an increase in 300,000 of the number of deaths due to infectious disease due to climate change. So again, in 2006, we were talking about the frogs. In 2019, we're talking about us, literally in this community here today. And the coronavirus, for those of you who don't know, came from a wild animal market. It came from our exploitation of animals, or at least that's our best estimate, according to the Centers for Disease Control. OK. So again, what's happening to the animals of this earth might not seem like a big deal, but these are the canaries in the climate mine. If we don't be mindful of what happens to the other inhabitants of this earth, we're all part of the same genealogical web. It's not a chain. It's not a hierarchy. It's a web of life. 
and when the other life on this earth is dying, it is a preview of what's going to happen to us if we don't change now. Let's move on to the second point, eating our dead. The instrumental value of the animal rights movement. Does anyone know what this is a scene of? It's sad and distressing. Okay, it's, it's a hurricane and a flood caused by a hurricane. And this is actually not Hurricane Florence, although there were many scenes like this from Hurricane Florence. Um, the pork industry and the pig farming industry was smart enough to realize they couldn't allow these sorts of things to happen, so they didn't allow as many of these images to come out. But this is actually a, a scene from Hurricane Floyd in 1999, when there was not a much, as much awareness about factory farms. But what happened with Hurricane Florence is the climate, you know, with climate change causing more extreme weather events like hurricanes, there is mass flooding and huge pig farms. There are tens of millions of pigs who are raised and slaughtered for food in North Carolina. The flood levels rose, and these pigs literally had nowhere to go. In some cases, drowned in their barns. In some cases, you know, got outside, were even standing on roofs, desperately hoping for someone to come rescue them. And there's many, many problems with this. First of all, the number of pigs in North Carolina is far smaller than the number of human beings. But because pigs produce so much waste, and it's so concentrated, cumulatively, pig farming in North Carolina creates 10 billion, with a B, gallons of waste every year and massive manure lagoons. And when the floodwaters came in, these manure lagoons, which are filled with chemicals, antibiotics, disease, decomposing corpses of animals, flooded the entire region of North Carolina. And of course, it's the communities of color that live next to these farms that are most adversely affected. You also probably know, or you might have heard, that all the waste from these farms and from feedlots that ha raise cattle for both milk and for meat creates a huge amount of methane. And methane is 28 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. Estimates range from 10 to 51 percent of all greenhouse gases produced by the United States are coming directly from feedlots like this one. And then finally, of course, there's antibiotic resistant diseases. 70 percent of all human grade antibiotics in this country are being fed to farm animals. These farm animals are growing superbugs within their bodies that then jump to us and kill us. And the coronavirus is a great example of this. The CDC uh, says that, that the best the best hypothesis as to where the coronavirus came, which has killed, I think, close to 1,000 people now and could cause a great global pandemic, similar to the flu epidemic in the early 20th century, is a wild animal market, a, a live animal market in Wuhan, China. Because all the first cluster of people who came down to the coronavirus, it all came from this wild animal market. It may have come from a bat, may have come from another animal. They eat all sorts of animals, unfortunately, in these live animal markets. And I like to call this zombie capitalism, that when we turn these living creatures into corpses, those corpses come back to haunt us. They haunt us by destroying our environment. They haunt us by destroying our water and our air. And they haunt us by literally destroying our own bodies, because the diseases that are killing them will eventually kill us. But it's not just that harming animals and ignoring the harm we're causing animals hurts us. It's that human beings, it turns out, really, really value, for our own sake, what's happened to animals. Anyone know who this is? Any guesses? Cecil the Lion. So anyone remember Cecil the Lion? Do you remember this from 2015? Okay, so Cecil the lion was a beloved lion in a wildlife animal park who was not supposed to be hunted, and he was unfortunately hunted. A hunter hit him with a crossbow. Um, Cecil ran away with a crossbow in his shoulder and slowly bled out over 12 hours and died a torturously painful death. And Cecil the lion, well, you know, you hear people all the time say, oh, forget about animals. People don't care about animals, and politicians say this all the time. Like, politicians are always telling me, I'm going and knocking on their doors, begging them to take some action about factory farms, about the abuse of animals in the environment. And they say, people don't care about animals at all. Well, it turns out Cecil the Lion was one of the biggest news events maybe of the decade. <laughs> in a single day, there were 12,000, this is just a single day, 12,000 mainstream media articles about Cecil the Lion, 700,000 social media postings. And when Jimmy Kimmel cried about Cecil the Lion on national television, within a few hours, $150,000 have been raised to support wildlife conservation in Africa. It turns out the US government also already accepts that animals matter to some extent. We have a law in the books called the Endangered Species Act that is run by a group of lawyers called the God Squad, where we literally spend billions of dollars protecting endangered species already. So if we just took the amount of money we're currently using to protect animals and endangered species, if we took the amount of money that people are currently donating to protect animals and the environment uh, for animals, and we just projected that out in a linear trajectory, over the next 30 years, both with the quantity of animals that are suffering and dying, the number of species that are going extinct, that means we should increase the amount of spending and the amount of resource mobilization to protect animals and wildlife and species by like a thousandfold. Right? So even if only all you care about is how much human beings care about animals, it turns out we need to invest 
like a thousand-fold more resources and in protecting natural systems from devastation like this. Okay. But third and finally is the intrinsic value of animals. And this is the most important point I want to leave you with. Um, so does everyone remember the financial crisis in 2008? Probably most of you. I guess some of the younger students might remember. Anyone not remember the financial crisis of 2008? Nearly brought down the entire global economy? Okay. So d who remembers? And who, who feels like you have a good understanding of what happened there? Okay, you sound like, so tell us what happened. What, what was the cause of the financial crisis in a few sentences? Uh, I was shaking my hand. I'm, oh, maybe not. I'm not <laughs> I can fill it in. If you get yeah. something wrong, I'll fill it in. Um, where um, it's subprime mortgages were given out to people that should not have had, that would not just be a qualified for mortgages. Um, and then when. Myth. No. Let him finish. Let him finish. Go ahead. I'm so happy to be corrected. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's right. Um, and then sort of like when, when that started to crack a little bit, it all fell down. Yeah. So what happened is there was kind of a nationwide decline in home prices, triggered in part by bad lending, like banks had been offering everyone lots of money to buy whatever homes, and often using these kind of fancy subprime mortgages that had teaser rates, that were doing things to basically trick people into buying homes that they could not actually afford. Right? And what happened when there was a nationwide decline in mortgage prices and everyone realized, oh my gosh, all these homes are going down, all these borrowers cannot pay off their loans, there was a bank run. Effectively, everyone was selling off all these assets. They're going to their bank and saying, I want out. And that caused a financial collapse that nearly brought down the entire global economy. Okay. So derivatives and bundling is more of an evil than... Let's, let's talk about this. This is just an example. So let's talk about this after the talk in the Q&A. Okay? Great. It's a great point. But let's talk about it afterwards. So what, what, what economics experts designed after the 2008 time period is something called a financial stress test. And the idea is... If our economic system is actually a good economic system, we cannot allow things like that to happen again. We can't have decline in one asset by 5, 10, 15 percent cause a global cascade that destroys the entire economy of the globe. And they designed what are called financial stress tests, which are basically tests where you look at some possible bad scenarios and you see how the economic system does. And they even did this on a bank by bank basis. They went to all the big, big banks and said, OK, let's say your assets decline by 5 or 10 percent or 5 or 10 percent of your depositors come forward and say, I went out, cash me out. You need to be able to prove you can survive that, that your economic system actually works in that worst case scenario, because that scenario is going to happen. Right? So the argument I want to make today is that when we think about both the human and the non-human victims of climate change that are not the most powerful and wealthy victims of climate change, and I mean people in Bangladesh who 70 percent of the, the nation's land is now underwater, 18 million people will soon be homeless um, because the salt water is flooding their land. They can no longer grow crops and they can no longer live on this land because they live in a low sea level area of Southeast Asia. When we think about the polar bears of this earth who have no political power, who have no money, who have no ability to fight and protest if climate change policies are enacted, we need to think about our political institutions as surviving a stress test. And as I said at the start of this talk, the ultimate test of whether a political system is just is how does it treat those without power. How does it treat those without wealth? Because every political system can survive the stress of the powerful asking for justice. The powerful are always treated fairly because they have power. Right? But the definition of justice is a system that treats those with no power as if they're deserving of respect. So when we think about climate change, instead of thinking about how much it's going to cost a corporation like Amazon or a corporation like Exxon, we should think about how much it's going to cost the Bangladeshi child who might have to live in a garbage dump in a congested urban area in Bangladesh because their home and their village ancestral homeland that they've lived in perhaps for thousands of years is now underwater. We should think about the polar bear mother who, after swimming for days and watching all of her babies die off, arrives in the Arctic region and sees no food available to her. And sometime in the next few decades, one of these polar bear mothers will swim up to the Arctic, look around, realize she has never seen, she's not seen another polar bear in years, She'll lest her dead head down on the ground and realize that this is the last polar bear on the face of the earth. If we want to prove that our political system is actually just, not just for these marginalized peoples and for these marginalized animals, but even for us, we have to have a political stress test that proves out the concept that our institutions are robust to even situations where the person being harmed or the animal being harmed has no ability to fight back. Because after all, at any point it could be one of us. It could be the Chinese kid who's on the other end of the system. It could be the Jewish kid. It could be the immigrant from France. Any of us could be on the other end of that system. If we don't prove that our system is robust enough, that the, the notion of equality and fair play and respect for all sentient life has not 
infused itself into the code, the political DNA of our society to the point that even those without power are being protected, then our system can be used against anyone in a corrupt and oppressive way. So what does this all mean concretely? I'm going to give you an example from a specific location that's actually just a few blocks from my house. This is Golden Gate Fields. And many of you know that in the Bay Area and frankly around the nation, we have a housing crisis. The average apartment is $3,000. Homelessness has increased by 42% over the last three years. We now have thousands of people living in homeless encampments. And this is an older image. But if this were a more recent image, you'd actually see a bunch of tents lining up under the highway. Because when someone is kicked out of their home and no longer can afford uh, an apartment, a roof over their head, the place they usually will try and live is in these underpasses. Because when the rain comes down, they at least have some shelter for themselves. This is an image from a few days ago. So if you went here today at Golden Gate Fields, you'd see tents lining the highway, underneath the highway, and increases of 42% over the past couple years. Um, you'd see RVs along the side of the streets, because a lot of people are losing their homes or moving to RVs. And over here at Golden Gate Fields, you see millionaires and billionaires drinking lots of wine, racing horses to death in a circle over and over again. So what I want to do is do kind of a little political analysis. Let's do a political stress test of Golden Gate Fields and ask ourselves how various individuals who are living here and actually going to Golden Gate Fields, and these are all real world examples. In many cases, they're people I actually know. And how our political system works with these people along three different dimensions. One is, how much of the problem are these people causing, right? In terms of climate devastation, income inequality, uh, pollution to the air and the water, how much is being contributed by, by this particular individual? Second, how much do they have to contribute to solve the problem? And third, how much is our society and our government asking them to contribute, okay? So let's start with the billionaire. There's a lot of billionaires in the Bay Area. You know, I, I live near some billionaires, surprisingly, not that close, because I live in the poor area, neighborhood of Berkeley. But if you go 15 minutes away, 10 minutes away in the Berkeley Hills, there are billionaires. And in fact, the Bay Area has more billionaires than anywhere in the world. There's so many billionaires. A lot of these billionaires actually have multiple homes. Um, some of them even have homes in Berkeley and San Francisco, even though it's only about 25, 30 minutes away. You can have a mansion in Berkeley and a mansion in San Francisco. And um, a lot of these billionaires also travel around the world. You know, they're flying to New York City, London. They often have a home in New York City, in the Bay Area, in Beijing, all sorts of places. And it turns out these billionaires did a very good job of, of political lobbying back in the 80s and 90s. And there's a law in the books that says capital appreciation of real estate investments is never taxed. So um, this billionaire flies into Berkeley, uses enormous amount of fossil fuels, and emits huge numbers of greenhouse gases because flying is very destructive to the climate and the environment lives in an extremely large home in Berkeley that when you heat it or cool it or even just provide electricity, it uses a huge number of greenhouse gases. Um, and when his, the value of his property appreciates, say by $10 million, so he's got a couple homes, um, how much do you think of that as tax? Well, I've already told you. It's zero. There's, there's no taxation on that at all. So uh, the, the billionaire is contributing a high level to the environmental devastation and human and non-human suffering has $10 million that he hasn't worked for. It's just kind of real estate speculation. The value of the property has gone up. He's just sat in his offices or flown back and forth between London and the Bay Area. And he has $10 million of real money that he could use. That could, he could go to anything in our society. Um, and he pays exactly $0 in taxes. So let's move to the second person. So I told you there's the billionaires who are sitting in the Golden Gate fields. Um, watching the horses race each other to death. There actually have been dozens of horses that have died on the tracks, for the record. So it's a cruel facility as well. There's a houseless resident across the street, someone who was a dog walker who got kicked out of their apartment because rentals got so high they could no longer live in their apartment. And you know, when the average apartment is $3,000 a month, a lot of people are kicked out of their apartments or evicted permanently. This person can no longer afford a home in Berkeley, even though they lived there their entire lives. Um, and they're continuing to walk dogs, but they had to just hitch, put, put up a tent on the side of the street, right outside of Golden Gate Fields, underneath the highway underpass. They use basically no greenhouse gases because they can't afford a flight. They don't have a home, so they have no heating or cooling costs. They don't have a car, so there's no fossil fuels from their transit. They do contribute a little because they hop on a bus and a train to get all their dog walking gigs. Um, and again, I know people like this. I know people who were dog walkers who lost their homes and are now living on the streets. Um, this houseless person is earning $10,000 by walking 20 dogs a week for $10 a walk, which is actually a lot of work. Walking 20 dogs a week, has anyone walked a lot of dogs before? It's not easy to walk one dog. Walking 20 dogs a week is actually a lot of work, and it's an important service. Like, I have dogs. It's actually really important to me that someone walks my dogs. If not me, somebody's got to walk my dogs. So they're doing good hard work. They're earning $10,000 a year from walking 20 dogs a week at $10 per walk, and their tax rate is, what do you think they pay in taxes? How much are they paying? The billionaire 
paid zero dollars on a $10 million increase in wealth, how much do you think they're paying? Who knows the tax system? 15%. 15 so they're paying about $1,500 because the Social Security and Medicare taxes, if you're part of the gig economy, which you know, increasingly young people like you can't get jobs in real corporations because the corporations are using robots or you know, people from around the world can, can automate away your jobs. So you're, you're self-employed, you're an independent contractor, so you're paying your full 15% labor tax, which is what this dog walker has to do. So the billionaire is paying less taxes, both in terms of the total amount <laughs> and in terms of the amount, uh, the, the percentage amount, than the homeless person across the street from Golden Gate Fields. Okay, and then finally, let's think about the horse. Um, so horses in racing tracks spend about 23 hours out of 24 hours out of every day living in a stall, basically as small as their own body. They come out for one hour a day where they're beaten and injected with drugs non-consensually. Many of them die because whenever there's an accident and they break down, they euthanize them. And you may have heard about this in the media, that there have been dozens of horses killed at Santa Anita, Golden Gate Fields, and Berkeley is owned by the same company. And there was a horse who died just a few weeks ago in a racing accident. This horse does not use any fossil fuels at all because he's a horse. He's not using fossil fuels. He just sits in his little stall all day. So he's contributing basically nothing to the problem of environmental de devastation and climate change. And the fruit of his labor, you know, if he's, unless he's a famous horse, um, is probably about $1,000. And, and by, the t by the end of the year, that $1,000 probably includes the sale price of the horse when his body breaks down. And horses in racing, they'll break down after a few years. So you know, normally it would probably be less than this, but let's say he's sold off to a stockyard at the end of the year, where incidentally, many of these horses are then shipped to places like Canada and Mexico and slaughtered. In fact, um, shockingly, I didn't even learn this until I started preparing these slides, there was a winner of the Kentucky Derby in 1986, Ferdinand, who went on to make millions of dollars for his owners. He was then killed in a Japanese slaughterhouse in uh, 1995, nine years later, and sold off for meat, possibly for pet food. So this horse is earning $1,000 for our society that could be used as something because you know, there are people gambling, coming in buying tickets, the billionaires are coming in watching him run around in a circle, and then when his body is sold off, you know, he might be sold for $500, $400, and then shipped off to Canada to be slaughtered for people in France to eat. Um, how much is society taking from him? Well, they're taking everything, right? That horse, none of that money that he's generated, none of that labor goes back to him. When his owner decides, you know what, you're no longer working out for me, I'm sending you off to Japan to be eaten or to France to be slaughtered, that horse gets nothing. Um, and again, as I said, even some of the most famous horses in history, like Ferdinand, who won the Kentucky Derby in 1986, were shipped off to slaughter when they were no longer useful, when they were too old to stud or to race, they were killed and eaten because their owners could make some money. Okay, so what we're seeing is our political institution is failing the political stress test. Right? By any definition of justice, those who are contributing the least to the problem and have the least to offer are being asked for the most. Like these horses, the homeless person, is paying a higher tax rate than the billionaire. The horse gets nothing at all as the billionaire is watching him run around in a circle. And so what I think we need to do is invert that, right? And, and this is what we call the Green New City. And, and actually I'm running for mayor of Berkeley on this platform, of trying to invert that dynamic that we've seen for too long in our society and give those who have the most and are causing the most a fair part of that burden. And the thing is, even billionaires, when you actually talk to them about these specific examples, they recognize, yeah, this isn't fair. And what we have to do is talk about this more often because too, for too long, Electoral politics in this country have been controlled by the wealthy or the powerful, by the people who have the time and the influence and the resources and the connections to make change happen for their class. And what we need is not a system that just serves the few, but a system that serves all. Because that by, by definition, a just system is one where the powerless are protected. So in this Green New City, which I'm calling Triple Up Climate Justice, and I think I'm borrowing this from other folks who've coined this term, this is a carbon positive, plant-based city by 2025, one that starts by divesting taxpayer resources from wealthy industries like fossil fuels, animal ag, the restaurant industry, and instead announcing the, the, the creation of a green district that is completely pedestrian, where public transit is free, where we have solar panels instead of roads, and where every single resident of Berkeley is given a $1,000 green dividend to invest in this district, right? That I don't care if you're a houseless person on the street or you're a billionaire in the hills, everybody can share in the benefits of this district. If you cause a problem, you chip in a little more. And if you don't have much to give, we give you a little bit more back. So if we can create this sort of district, the goal and the vision is not just to create one green city, but it's to solve the national paralysis we're currently seeing. And whether you like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or frankly even Donald Trump, we're not gonna get this done at the national level. This rectification of our political 
uh, injustices, of our economic injustices, is not going to happen at the national level because at the end of the day, national politics depends too much on big institutions that are too slow to change. And if we are facing a crisis, if a million species are going extinct, if homeless people don't have food on their plates, our roofs over their heads, and it actually is a crisis, we can't set timelines of 2035, 2045, or 2050. We have to do this now. And that means taking urgent, bold action to address this crisis in at least one city. And if we can do it in one city, and one of the reasons I moved to Berkeley is because Berkeley has led the nation in so many different social and political and economic areas. Berkeley is a city filled with progressives and liberals and hippies who are willing to experiment. If we can prove out the concept in one city and say, in one city, we can have green housing for everyone, green food for every family, and a green dividend for the future instead of subsidies for billionaires, then we can say to the rest of the state, the rest of the nation, and frankly, the rest of the world, that carbon neutrality, climate justice, animal justice is actually possible. So that's what I end you with. Um, this is not an experiment that's only going to happen in Berkeley. It's going to experiment that will unfold in other cities across the nation. There are other cities like Cortiva, Brazil, that are also trying experiments like this. And we have to recognize is if we don't change our local city councils, our boards of supervisors, our own streets and communities, we're not going to be able to change national politics. So as, as much as it's exciting to listen to what Bernie has to say, what Elizabeth has to say, and maybe even what Donald has to say sometimes, it's much more important for you to find out what your local supervisor has to say and what you personally can do to change your community. So let's get out there and let's try and do something about this. Thank you all very much for listening to me and I can take some questions. So, questions, critiques, thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. Can I play devil's advocate? Please, Please yeah, <laughs> I invite you to play devil's advocate. I, I do want to start out by saying uh, my family has a long history of fighting injustice. Um, my name is Eric Stowe. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of Harriet Beecher. So you might have heard of Leland. My dad was a professor here, plant physiologist, taught environmental science. Cool. I have a lot of vegan friends. Yeah. We swing the pendulum back and forth on environmental issues. And I'm a reductionist. I'm not a vegan. But I can see being a vegetarian, although it's a lot of work. Uh, but since I age 16, I've always thought eggs are the way to rescue poverty in the third world and, and poor, you know, nutrition. Yeah. That you, you can get somebody even who's marginally uh, living and, and it's not too hard to raise chickens. Yeah. And eggs are just like excellent protein source. Sure. So I, I, I'm an advocate for, for uh, animal rights, but I also point out, and I know a lot of people may think I'm a little crazy, but plants have a consciousness too. Yeah. You know, so I can't see if you're, you're I always say yeah. to my vegan friends, you know, the broccoli scream when you pick them because you don't yeah. give them the chance to flower. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and so I do think that there's an energy there that we're working yeah. with. Should be respected. And, and man had this amazing relationship with bovines for thousands, a couple years. thousand years that got us through the ice age. Uh, but we've now reached a point where maybe we can leave milk behind. Although I'm not really, I'm kind of against milk, but I'm kind of for yogurt. Sure. Everybody's got a little bit of a different gut, yeah. and, and, and we've got to work on moving in the correct direction. Yeah. Uh, it so seems to be tackling fossil fuels and climate change. I mean, you said that yeah. the yeah. horse doesn't contribute to anything, but he does contribute to methane. I yeah. mean, if a the cows bit. do, the horses yeah. do, maybe not as so much. So do we when we breed carbon dioxide. So we do in the same way. Yeah. Right, right. So you're right, it's not zero. So I think your point is, is well taken. So, and if you look at kind of the environmental impacts of various industries, the egg industry and the poultry industry are much less devastating than the, ranch, the ranching industry. So for example, the Amazon wildfires, primarily caused by cattle ranching, not by poultry farms or by egg farms. Nonetheless, th there's a basic kind of physical reason that any time you move through trophic levels, and feed all these plants to animals and then convert that into whether it's eggs or flesh, you're gonna lose lots of energy. And so even the most efficient animal products, which are chickens, are, uh, I think it was David Pimentel at Cornell University who did the analysis on this, about one eighth as efficient as plant-based foods of the same type, right? So you're talking about you're losing 70, 80% of the potential energy that you could be feeding directly to human beings to the animals who then convert into energy that we eat. But the second point I make is, is the last point of this 
pre presentation, which is that the problem of using eggs isn't just the immediate impacts, the instrumental impacts on human beings. It's the notion that we can use other beings for our profit, right? And if we're going to feed 7 billion human beings eggs and give them enough protein, inevitably we're going to put lots of those beings in cages. We're going to put them in factory farms because there isn't enough land on this earth to house all these chickens if we don't put them in factory farms. These chickens don't have the ability to consent. They're going to be used as commodities for profit. And it's not dissimilar to the issue of child labor 100 years ago, where in theory it might be possible for us to have children working in mass in factories and sweat houses and so on and producing good products for the people and providing to their families. But the problem is anytime you put a powerless class of beings into a system that is driven by profit, those beings will be trampled on, which is why I believe in the ab abolition of animal exploitation. But I do want to make one important point about veganism and vegetarianism. You'll notice that I didn't say much about consumption or vegetarianism or veganism in this talk. And the, the people I talked about, the billionaires, the homeless person, the horse, who's you know, probably a vegetarian, hopefully a vegetarian, although they do sometimes feed horses and cows, horse and cow meat. The solution to this problem is not going to come from consumers making different choices because what I hope that political stress test showed you is that there are institutions that are designed around us that drive us towards certain choices and away from others. Right? So the fact that most people are not vegetarian has a lot more to do with the fact that McDonald's is a $100 billion company to the fact that the Farm Bill gives $20 billion plus in subsidies to animal agriculture every single year while in many cases taking money away from food stamps for kids to the fact that when you look at the food chain, when you grow up as a kid, everyone is told from the day they're born, despite the fact that we have compelling evidence otherwise, that you have to eat meat and dairy. There are all these institutional forces that are driving people to consume animal products that we need to overcome before we even start with individual level outreach. So this is one thing that makes DXC very different. Our focus is not on trying to persuade individuals one by one that they should go vegetarian or vegan. We're asking them, whether they're vegetarian or not, to join the movement to stop factory farming. Any other questions or comments? Let me, let me give someone else a chance to talk. Okay. Follow up with me afterwards. I just want to make sure everyone gets some space. No problem. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, please. For people in the room who might not know your history and the felony charges and the film that you showed in the beginning of, of what you were all doing, I think it might be beneficial to explain that you were actually trying, you were, you were protected by law. We were. That, those, that there is a law on the books that protects animals from abuse and you were saving them from the abuse, and that is completely legal, and yeah. yet you were up against those massive lines of police and riot gear yeah. for actually doing something that's completely legal. Yeah, every state of the nation, animal cruelty is a crime, and leaving an animal to starve to death, to be trampled to death in a pen who's sick, who's weak, is also a crime. And you know, this is not us saying this. We've worked with prosecutors across the nation who agree with this. The problem is something called prosecutorial discretion that most people who are not lawyers don't know about, which is that, in fact, most violations of law are not ever prosecuted or enforced. You might intuitively know this because you've probably jaywalked. Has everyone jaywalked in the room? And you probably haven't been prosecuted, right? Because the prosecutor has exercised discretion. There's actually many levels of discretion. There's the law enforcement officer on the street who sees you jaywalking and says, OK, this is not deserving of a ticket or an arrest. This is just, there's no cars. There's no harm, I'll just let the person walk, right? And the same is true, unfortunately, at, on the level of animal cruelty. And because corporations have such immense influence, especially in the rural counties where most of these factory farms exist, they're donating money to politicians, they're funding campaigns, they're going in and out of the very regulatory bodies that are supposed to protect the animals and the environment and consumers from the violations of law that are happening at factory farms. Most violations and violations of industry standards, too, go completely unacknowledged, much less held to account. So what we have tried to do is go into these factory farms, find clear violations of law, get legal opinions, veterinary opinions, showing these are violations of law. And these are pretty egregious violations. There are things like using a car carcinogenic antibiotic feed for the animals. Things like lying about corporate commitments that have made to take animals out of gestation crates. Things like leaving animals to starve and dehydrate to, to death, to the point that one Costco egg farm we found close to 20% of the animals literally in a starvation and cannibalism conditions. And these are numbers the industry didn't even reject. We, we found the company's own records saying that 20% of the animals had died and that the most common reason they had all died was cannibalism. They had been pecking each other to death inside the farm. 
And yet when we go and present these findings to the authorities, very often instead of prosecuting the farmer and the company, they prosecute us. What, what Susan is pointing out is there's a doctrine of law that exists in the English common law that whether there's a statute or not, and many times we have statutory protections, whistleblower protections for employees or activists who identify some misconduct happening at a factory farm or frankly any corporate abuser, but there's also a doctrine of law that infuses the English common law system called legal necessity. And both the climate movement and the animal rights movement have been, now been using this doctrine of law to justify direct action against corporations engaged in abuse. So this is what happened at Standing Rock. This is what happened um, at, at the White House when Julian Bond, among others, arrest, chained himself to the White House gates and said, I have to do this because our planet is burning. And the idea behind legal necessity is when you've exhausted all your legal avenues and you're doing something that is clearly in the public interest, you have the right to engage in otherwise unlawful behavior. A classic example is there's a dog in a hot car. Normally you can't break somebody's window, but if there's a dog in a hot car, you can see they're suffering from heat exhaustion and they're dying. You've called the police, there's no one around who can help. You can just go ahead and break that window and take that dog to the vet. And we make the same argument with respect to factory farms and the misconduct we find in factory farms. Whether that argument will prevail is up to a jury in, in my case, in North Carolina, two juries in Utah, and one jury in California. What we hope is that these cases prevail, it'll open the floodgates for activists like us to do this sort of work across the world and create a real crisis for the industry, including the fossil fuel industry. Because in addition to being one of the co-founders of Direct Action Ever, I'm on the board of the Climate Defense Project that has been defending the valve turners. Does anyone know about the valve turners? Okay. So they're these activists, really great people, like you know, um, Ken Ward, an older gentleman, retired, who is just sick of seeing the planet burn. And what he did, all he did was he went up to, to kind of a, I think it was a refinery, and turned the valve to shut it off, which caused all sorts of, you know, collateral consequences for the company because they had to, you know, all their business basically stopped for a day. But all he did was turn a valve and he was charged with felonies. And what we want to argue for climate activists and for animal rights activists is when there's a planetary emergency, when there's some individual victim who is about to die, we have the right to go in and try and alleviate that harm if the government is not going to act. And if we win, you know, that will not only open the floodgates from our activism, but put pressure on our politicians to address these issues more systematically. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks for being here. Please. Um, I find this really interesting. I, I find the, your use of language that we usually um, think of to, to talk about human political communities to include animals in the sense that uh, you know, the moral test for society is how it treats its, its, its powerless members, uh, or most powerless members. Um, you know, most people probably think that there's a bright line yeah. that excludes animals from the political community. Yeah. And I'm curious how you came to feel that that bright line yeah. was not as bright as, as people think and, and how, um, how you see people um, in your movement finding that line to be softer. Then I guess the, the sort of second layer of the question is, you know, this theory of trickle-up climate justice that says that, um, uh, you know, if people are willing to do these things to animals, it, it brutalizes them and makes them more likely to do them to humans, and, and protecting animals is a, is a first step toward protecting human beings. You know, of course, there are human beings right now who are being harmed in incredible ways. And Hundreds of thousands. Exactly, and it's not a matter of, you know, <clears throat> if one day they come for immigrants or, you know, yeah. Uyghur folks in China, if that's happening now. Do you, do you feel as though, I know these are two large questions, but um, how do you deal with this idea that there, yeah. there is a, an opportunity cost to the efforts of your political movement? Yeah, great question. So the, the answer to the first question is my dog, like a lot of people. I think the, the exception to the general rule in human communities that people think animals, non-human animals, are less morally important than human animals is their own companion animals. And if you look at kind of the amount of money that the average dog guardian or cat guardian spends on their animals in the United States, it's far more than they're giving for the Bangladeshi child or even the homeless person on the street. They care a lot about that individual animal. So at least with respect to this dog, this cat, this rabbit, the speciesism frontier has been broached. This person understands this animal matters. And for most people, if you ask them, they're not doing it just because they like the dog as a toy. The dog is interesting entertainment for them. They, they do conceive of that dog very differently than a TV or a car or vacation to Disneyland. They care about the dog for their own sake. One way you can tell this is people leave money to their dogs. They're terrified about what's going to happen. In fact, like, you know, pet insurance, life insurance for your pets is a huge booming business because so many older Americans are terrified that my dog or cat could go to a shelter and be euthanized if I die and she's still alive. So for most people, when they think about animals, 
if there's an individual in front of them, they recognize that this is a being that's worthy of some social and political and moral consideration. The addendum I want to make to that point is that if you look at polling data across the nation and across the world, public opinion is changing very rapidly on animal issues. And the Gallup poll has done this poll asking the public, how many of you think that animals should have the same rights as human beings over the last 15 years? And it keeps going up and up and up and up. So if you ask people about 15 years ago, it was about one in five to up to one in four Americans would say that animals should have the same rights as human beings. Now it's about one in three. And an even more recent poll that was done by of all people in agricultural economists show that one in two Americans want to ban slaughterhouses in this country. Now one in two Americans are not vegetarian or vegan. But what that tells you is that people see the future. They see the possibilities of a world where we no longer have to slaughter animals. And even if they themselves are not willing to make the commitment to give up eating animals yet, they want that to happen. They want to imagine a world where animals no longer have to be slaughtered, where the environment no longer has to be devastated. They just want us as politicians and elected leaders to find those solutions. Um, so your second question is, is also a tough question. The first question I think is actually an easier one because I think public opinion is changing. And I think for many people who actually have individual experiences of animals, you know, and frankly, even people who don't have individual experiences of animals, I think I, I read an article recently that the most shared thing on Facebook is animal videos. And if you don't believe me, go to the Dodo Facebook page and look at how many views their videos have and compare that, frankly, to the NFL. Like, it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> that the Dodo gets more views on an average video than the NFL does. And you think the Super Bowl is big business, go to the Dodo. But your, your second question is also an important question because even if animals are significant and have some moral political value, if they're Uyghurs being confined in concentration camps in, in China, if they're immigrants who are being held in detainment facilities, and in some cases being killed, left to die on the border with Mexico, can we talk about animals? And, and there are a lot of people who will give you kind of the cliched response, which is, oh, it all works together, you know, that we can save them all. And I don't think that's true. I think there are some opportunity costs that have to be made. And the only point I'd make to you is we're not even making a trade-off right now. When Bill Nordhaus, the most famous climate economist in the world, says the value of all the million species that are going extinct, all the trillions or potentially quadrillions of animals who are suffocating to death in the oceans is worth zero, then we're just not getting it right. We're not getting it right at all because we've ignored that issue entirely. And that's what happens when a community is completely politically silenced. That's what happened with juveniles in the 18th century when they started moving to the factories. They didn't have much political power. And even if you want to argue, well, you know, I, I worry about the kids in the factories, but we also have to worry about racism, right? At least you're going to have a conversation about how we make that trade-off. Right now what's happening is there's no trade-off happening at all. Because the folks who are frankly even just trying to give accurate information about what's happening to the animals are too often being silenced. So we have to get animal rights into the political discourse and then we can have those tough conversations about opportunity costs that frankly we have to have about all issues. You know, healthcare and immigration, there's a trade-off there too. Climate change and healthcare, another trade-off. We don't know how we can prioritize one over the other until we start having that conversation. And the time to start having that conversation about animals and climate justice is now. Yeah. Um, for the new city idea, how do you imagine best funding it? Would it be private yeah. investment? Speak up. For your Green New City idea, what's the best way to finance it? Would it be issuing debt, increasing taxation, private investments? How do you see a building? Like? I think a combination of them. I think what, what I'm proposing is that first and foremost, we have to increase taxation on folks who have mansions. And there's a way around the, the property tax law that I mentioned. It's called Prop 13 that prevents you from raising property taxes when home values increase. It's kind of a ridiculous thing that you know, someone who does no work and just sits on their property and makes a billion dollars out of it doesn't have to pay a dime of taxes. Well, the homeless person who's walking dogs pays 15%. That makes no sense. What you can do is tax things like vacancy. You can't tax property. But if someone is not living in their home, we can impose a use tax and say, this home is empty. This is a, basically a nuisance to the community that we have this empty mansion here when we have thousands of people sitting on the streets. And so we're going to charge you, you know, $1,000 an hour <laughs> for that home to be empty uh, unless you start living in the home. And I think uh, there are a lot of innovative taxation schemes like this that economists are coming up with that can get around the constitutional concerns. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of those fights might be difficult. They'll involve litigation because rich people will fight them and say, hey, this is de facto a property tax. You're not allowed to do that in California. So we probably will have to do things like go into debt. 
You know, I think bond offerings are important to do. But if we get this right, if we actually make this a green city, if we have a green district that is completely sustainable while the roads are gone, it's pedestrian only, there are solar panels everywhere and trees everywhere, and we have a green dividend and we're giving everyone $1,000 so all the business is coming in, tourism is coming in, hopefully we get private investment, both in terms of private consumption and tourism coming into the city, but also big green companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. From what I understand, the single biggest IPO in 2019 was Beyond Meat a plant-based food company. They have billions of dollars and they know that if we take some of that business that currently is going to climate destroying animal abusing industries like factory farms and give it to them, that's going to be a great stake for them financially. So we have to get them to join as partners. And I'm, you know, I, I totally hear the critique, the neoliberal critique of trying to get these companies involved, but when you're in an emergency situation and when our planet is, is literally burning, like our neighborhoods are burning, we have to get all hands on deck, including even factory farmers. If factory farmers are willing to voluntarily give up and join this movement, let's, let's, let's not stigmatize and demonize them. Let's find a way for them to transition, and this is already happening. There have been a number of factory farms, partly because of climate change, partly because of how onerous and difficult it is to work with the big corporations that really run everything. A lot of smaller scale contract farmers who said, I'm giving up the business and I'm gonna start raising mushrooms instead. I'm gonna start growing soy instead. And we need to do that on mass scale, but we have to start in one city. But the most important thing is, regardless of how we do it, if we don't have political leadership that's going to have that bold vision and say, we don't have time for this, you know, City of Berkeley is one of the most aggressive climate timelines that I've heard of, of any political or geographic unit in the United States of America. And its timeline of 2035 is less aggressive than Microsoft's. And, and our political system is lagging behind even big corporations like Microsoft in addressing the climate crisis. It should be the opposite. Our political leadership needs a lead, which means engaging in these difficult conversations and talking about trade-offs and saying, yes, it is going to suck to turn off all the natural gas stoves in the city of Berkeley. Yes, it is going to suck for some people to close off all our streets to cars and build solar farms instead. But we have a bold, beautiful vision of a city that's sustainable, that's going to save your future, your kid's future over the next generation. And even though it's going to be sacrificed, it's going to be a beautiful sacrifice because this vision is worth it. That's what our leadership needs to do. Not make excuses, not get defensive, not go to their donors and compromise the, the vision and the future that we all need to share in, but just be bold. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little to the um, whole practice of animal experimentation sure. in the medical field and what your ideas about that is. I mean, Yale gets millions of dollars every year in yeah, yeah, yeah. federal funding to do experimentation on animals happening now. And uh, yeah. you know, it's been shown that most of the experiments are bogus and don't yeah. prove anything in human disease. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's a great question. Super important to Yeah, this is an example of our political system disregarding the suffering of our marginalized class of beings and actually actively subsidizing the cruelty, right? The estimates are anywhere from maybe 10 to 100 million animals probably not including fish and rodents who are using experiments every day. And what you're pointing to is a systemic failure of animal cruelty laws because while we do in theory have an animal welfare act and you might think that the, I think there are even primates at Yale, right? Are there primates at Yale? Even the, you might think that primates at Yale are being protected by some federal or state laws. In fact, on the animal welfare act, which regulates experimentation, any procedure that is deemed scientifically necessary by the investigator is allowed no matter how cruel. So you're not allowed to just let, let your animal starve. If you, if you put a monkey in a cage and you, don't, you leave for a month and the monkey starves to death, that's not allowed in the Animal Welfare Act. But if I decide, you know what, I want to find out what happens when you rip monkeys' arms off and let them bleed to death. I just want to see what happens. That is totally kosher under federal law. Right? So this, this is the nature of the political system we live in today, where the other inhabitants of this earth are treated with such cruelty and barbarism that even if you intentionally inflict cruelty, as long as you deem it scientifically necessary, it's totally allowed. Um, I want to push back a little bit on the scientific merits of some of these studies, because to me, I don't even want to get in that debate, and I don't know what the answer to that is. That's, that's a question for scientists to answer. Uh, but the, the main point is, and it's the same point I made to you, we need to start considering the animals, at least. We need to think about whether they have a stake <laughs> in this system that we're building. And if they don't have a stake, why not? What is it that allows us to deny them some basic respect and consideration? And Yale is certainly part of that problem. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you maybe elaborate a bit more on sort of long term where you see 
you know, animals fitting into legal and political systems. I know, like, a yeah. lot of times you mentioned the importance of animal consent. You mentioned equal rights yeah. uh, to humans. I own a dog. It sounds like you also have dogs. Yeah, um, sure. Obviously, like, the way even more benign relationships are considered yeah. today, you know, it seems like there's more of a welfareist paradigm than, like, a, yeah, 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 yeah. we, you know, extend animals the same rights as humans. Like, long term, yeah. what kind of legal or political standing do you think it's reasonable to... For yeah, it's a great question. I think it's so important for us to have that vision because if we're going to say we demand animal rights, we need to visualize what that is so people understand what we're actually asking for. I think the best work in this area has been done by Will Kimlicka, who's a philosopher, I think, at the University of Queens. He wrote a book called Zoopolis, which is imagining a world where we have embraced trans species justice. But, but I think the basic idea with respect to domesticated animals, with respect to wild animals, I think for the most part we should leave them alone. Um, I'm sensitive to the idea we should intervene in some circumstances if there's a natural disaster, a disease outbreak, the chytrid fungus killing off, you know, probably billions, maybe trillions of amphibians all over the world. If there's something we can do to solve the problem, we should, probably should try. But human beings don't have the greatest record of intervening in natural systems to protect other beings. So, you know, probably what we do with the wild animals is first do no harm. Domesticated animals live with us. They depend on us. They are, have co-evolved with us for thousands, in some cases possibly tens of thousands of years, so we can't do that. But the great thing is we already have political institutions that are designed to address situations like that, namely guardianship. Right? So when you look at kind of how incapacitated human beings and young children are treated by the legal system, there's an entire set of legal institutions, of legal paradigms, and even case law that address how these beings can still be visible to the law. 150 years ago, that wasn't true. Like a father treated his child like a commodity, and that was OK. But there's a movement in this country for juvenile justice, for you know, child labor rights that created some paradigms that we can now extend to non-human animals. So the scale of the enterprise in many ways is numerically larger because there are more non-human animals. In fact, the most numerous terrestrial vertebrate on this planet is the domesticated chicken. There are about 23 billion chickens alive on the Earth today, which is way more human beings and way more than any other land animal exists. Um, so all these chickens need to be treated uh, with some legal paradigm. But the key thing is, in terms of the complexity and the nuance and the resources we'd have to invest in creating guardianship paradigms, the chicken's needs are not as sophisticated as a human child's. Right? The, the chicken is never going to need a right to education. It's not going to probably need a right to sophisticated health care as a human child, because chickens are actually fairly robust species. Human children, from the time they're born, because of how we evolved, they immediately need care. They cannot survive on their own. That's not true of a chicken. That's not true of a lot of these species that we've domesticated. So, but the most important thing to do is just start from the, the place that we already know and understand, namely juvenile justice, dealing with people who are mentally incapacitated and have a guardian ad litem, and then sending that to non-human animals. And while there are a lot of non-human animals now, if we just stopped forcibly impregnating and breeding these animals, their populations would decline by three, four, five orders of magnitude very quickly. Um, and I don't think, I'm not of the mindset that someone like Gary Francione has, which is that domesticated animals need to disappear. I don't think that's the case. I think if we just allow them to, uh, to have families just like us in a way that, that is consistent with good population management guidelines, they can coexist with us for generations with no problem. I'm going to give someone else who hasn't talked a chance. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You mentioned in North Huss's motto, uh, caveat is that it places no value on um, non-human animals. Yeah. Um, and maybe like discounting future welfare is also a caveat on the motto. I was wondering where you see um, a room for improvement in academic literature? Yeah. Like what topic should be worked on? Yeah, if I knew the answer to that question, I would have successfully completed my PhD, and I didn't. Uh, I dropped out in, in no small part because I couldn't figure this stuff out. And it's, it's hard because you want to critique Nordhaus's model, but you're like, well, what's, what, what's the alternative? And, and one of the fundamental problems we're seeing, not just in this context, but frankly across human civilization, is what sort of metrics do we use if we think money isn't the only measure of value? Right? This is something that David Cameron pointed out 10 years ago when he said, you know, the UK needs to start thinking about moving away from maximizing gross domestic product and maximizing gross happiness product. Um, Yancy Strickland, the, the founder of Kickstarter, everyone know Kickstarter, this cool company, that decided not to go public, unlike every other tech company. They said, we're not going to go public. We're going to become a B Corp instead, where we care about all our stakeholders. We care about our employees. We care about the local community. We care about our shareholders, too. But we care about everybody. And we don't want to be just another one of those C Corps that's trying to maximize the financial returns for our investors. 
But no one really knows what that means because it's hard to measure, you know? And, and this is true in many other domains alike. I mean, you know, uh, Nancy Strickland points out too that there's, there's so much of, of, of domestic labor that's not included. Women's labor, if, you, if there's a woman taking care of her children, there's no financial metric that, that measures the value that contributes to society, despite the fact that hopefully all of us agree that parents taking care of their children is a huge and important contributor to social value. Um, so my first answer to that question is that's a big problem that it goes far beyond animal rights, and I don't know the answer to that question. My second answer to that question is that is, it is particularly important in the context of animals because, at least in theory, most of these other domains of human life and value, you can imagine a way to financially measure it. Like, so for example, you could provide an implicit cost to labor in the home and, and add that to GDP. But the value that animals contribute, if you have a dog or a cat, you know, they're never going to work for you. Or maybe they'll work for you by bringing your paper, but it's not a material economic contribution to human civilization. What they're providing you is more intangible goods, things like companionship, love, connection, joy, counseling. Like my dogs are my best counselors every day. <laughs> but that's never going to be something we can financially measure. It's going to be very hard for us to financially measure. So part of what the animal liberation movement needs to do and part of what human civilization needs to do is move away from these financial metrics of well-being to other metrics that actually reflect what we care about. Because at the end of the day, you know, Richard Easterlin pointed this out a generation ago, when you start hitting five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars per capita, people don't get much happier with more money. You know, it's, it's more money, more problems. And it, there's been some research that's pushed back on that a little bit, but the general, the general thesis is still accurate, that there's massive diminishing marginal returns to money, and Jeff Bezos is not you know, a billion times happier than most of us, just because he has a billion times more money. In fact, he might be a very sad, he, he seems like kind of a sad, miserable person, to be honest, so I feel sorry for him for having all those billions. Can I answer this question, two words? Let's give someone else a chance to chat. And then let's, why don't you answer it afterwards? I really encourage everyone to connect, but unless, I'll, I'll come back to you if no one else has anything to say, okay? You have economics from MIT, right? You like I didn't finish it, so I failed in economics at MIT. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. So what you said is, I think we're just another kind of animal, and so should we, we should treat other animals just like we treat ourselves, just like we want people to treat us. And what's your name? Savannah. Savannah, thank you for offering that. Um, <laughs> Savannah is pointing out a, a philosophical concept that Peter Singer you know, spent decades refining, which is the interchangeability of perspectives. Right? It doesn't matter whether you're a black person, a white person, a gay person, a straight person, a dog or a cat, a human or a rat, that there's an interchangeability of our perspectives and our subjectivity that means we should treat all these beings that can be subjects of any sort of consciousness with respect. And if you doubt that animals can be subjects of consciousness, uh, Cambridge University, I think in 2012, gathered a, a huge mass of all the world's top neuroscientists and, and scholars of cognitive scientists and, and basically um, asked them, what do you think of animal consciousness? And there was an overwhelming consensus about as high as a consensus around anthropogenic human-caused climate change that animals, at least vertebrate animals, are in fact conscious. So what you're saying is, is not just philosophically sound, but is scientifically based as well. So thank you for sharing that. And, and we need, and of course the problem is, as with so many things, our legal and our political systems are lagging behind philosophic and scientific understandings because our legal system is a product of so much path dependency and hundreds of years of people fighting and lobbying of each other to design the political system we have today. So our political system today has to catch up and recognize that non-human animals are sentient beings deserving of some legal consideration. And if you want to read more about that, one of my former mentors and co-authors, Cass Sunstein, wrote a book called Animal Rights, New Directions. I wrote a paper in that book. I think it's called Animal Rights, New Directions. Um, and he has a, a a paper within that edited volume called Standing for Animals. What does a legal system look like that gives animals some legal consideration? Because currently animals are considered property. How do we start conceiving of these animals as something other than just property for a company or a human being to use and exploit? Any other questions? And we have until 5.30, so 
and I'll, I'll hang around here afterwards. Um, let me give someone else a chance to ask in, in case someone else, anyone else? And please offer critiques, like I love challenging questions. Another yeah. question, more like a comment. Please. You're in, in Connecticut for the, what, the legislature. Uh, it's very difficult to push for um, animal rights bill, bills or to even bring together the, the subject of protecting biodiversity to protect ourselves and, like, and to protect us from climate change. It's, it's very challenging, I have to say. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's scary the, the lack of knowledge of the you know, legislature. I know it's state reps, so but yeah, definitely. Uh, and other people in the room have experience with that too. First, can we thank the legislature for coming to the talk today and joining us all? Is David. David is one of these bold young politicians who's, who's setting aggressive climate timelines for, frankly, our entire civilization. But David has also pointed to something that I've experienced in 15 years of lobbying work, which is most legislators are incredibly conservative. And that's one of the reasons they got where they got, because they were the popular kid in school. And the popular kid in school is usually not the kid who goes out there and takes chances. That's why he's popular, because he does things that everyone else is doing. So what we need to do is put some unpopular kids in, into the prom, like David, and, and push the boundaries. <laughs> Unpopular, not in a bad sense. You know, the unpopular kid in high school is the cool kid 10 years later, right? Like, no one, no, everyone who's cool at the age of 35, everyone who's cool at the age of 35 probably wasn't that popular at the age of 16. And, and we just need to evolve our legislative bodies in the same way and recognize that just because someone doesn't follow the formula the Dem Democratic or the Republican Party has set out for how we can solve climate change for the past 20 years doesn't mean they can't be a very important voice within the legislature. And that's what we're seeing with AOC getting elected, you know, beating an incumbent who had been in Congress for 30 years. Um, in the Bay Area, we've had our first socialist elected to the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. So one of the, is it 10 supervisors, 11 supervisors? One of the 10 or 11 most powerful people in the city of San Francisco <laughs> is now a socialist. And however you feel about Democrats or socialists, it tells you that there's something revolutionary in the zeitgeist in our country today. People are sick and tired of politics as usual and want something different which is why it's so great to have you in the, in the Connecticut legislature. So thank you thanks. for stepping up. Well, thanks to grassroots. Yeah, it's thanks to grassroots. A team of people. Okay. So maybe one more question, and then I think we're done, because it's almost 530. One more question? If no one who hasn't spoken wants to speak, we can go back to you. No one new? Go ahead. I would just like to applaud what this little girl said. I think she cut right to the chase. Yeah, she um, did. And uh, it's really a simple. It's really simple, and I think it's values-based, and we have to start working on changing our values as, as a culture yeah. uh, worldwide. And that just hit the, she hit the nail on the head. And yeah. uh, maybe it's bringing in uh, faith-based communities in order to start changing perceptions as to what what defines success in life. It's not cap. It's not money. Yeah. It's not riches. It's it's love. Yeah. And and just kudos to you. you Thank you, Savannah. Indeed. It's not money, it's not riches, it's love. That's a great way to end the, the talk. So thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to hang out a bit, I'm going to hang out for a little while. I think some students and I are going out to dinner at a place called Claire's. I don't think you can join our table necessarily, but if you want to come to Claire's with us, I have no problem as long as the students don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. And we can all hang out and have some food. And then John, do you want to? Oh yeah, and if anyone wants to leave their uh, email address and phone number so you can get updates from us or join our mailing list, uh, I've got my laptop here, so just uh, stop on by. Yeah, and please do that. And come talk to me if you'd like to chat, okay? Thanks, everybody.